Um, so my name is Marek Vašer and I'm today going to talk about uh, what's new in the land of SOGF PGAs in 2018. Um, this talk is basically an update uh, on stuff I did uh, about a year ago, so you'll learn what uh, new stuff happened since. Quickly about me, uh, I work as a contractor for multiple companies. Uh, I mostly work on U-Boot, uh, Linux, Open and Beat It. I do some maintainer stuff in there. Uh, and I do FPGA stuff as a hobby, so uh, that's quickly about me, um, but it's not important. The important stuff is this talk, and I decided to split it into three biggish parts. The first part is introduction to FPGAs in general, what the FPGAs are, what the SOC is, and why do you want to use the combination, or maybe you do not want to use the combination. So this will put everyone on the same page, I hope. Uh, and then we'll go through the Altera stuff, which is now Intel, and then we'll go through Xilinx stuff. We'll talk about what's new in U-Boot, what's new in Linux. Uh, in case of the Xilinx stuff, we'll talk about the GPU situation, which starts to become not so much of a disaster. And uh, once we are through that, I have uh, one quick slide on security, because this is something I have no idea about. So it's just one slide. Um, but I mean, I got a lot of flack for saying some stuff on the mailing lists uh, without having any idea, so I, I want to give you that that sort of feedback in a more palatable form, all right? And once we are through that, we'll just wrap it up. <clears throat> so, um, what is an SOC, what's an FPGA? Um, who of you actually did any FPGA work? Hands up. Okay, so it's half of the people, that's, that's good. Um, and that's why I have to explain all that. Uh, for the other half. So SOC, you probably all know. That's uh, when you take a piece of silicon, you grab some sort of IP cores, uh, you grab a CPU core, sort of wire it up, synthesize that on the silicon, and you check out the chip, which has defined functionality. You cannot change it at runtime, right? That's an SOC. It's, it's literally set in stone, that design. Uh, an FPGA, on the other hand, uh, is a chip where you can define the functionality as a user, and you can actually change the functionality at runtime. So compared to an SOC, you can programmatically define how the chip will behave. Now, uh, both the FPGAs and the SOCs have some pros, they have some cons, uh, and that's why to get the best of both worlds, we have SOG FPGA solutions now, which basically combine uh, an SOC part and an FPGA part on the same piece of silicon. So it's one chip which has both. I want to talk about FPGAs a little bit more. Uh, so the abbreviation FPGA means uh, Field Programmable Gate Array. Um, that doesn't mean that it's somewhere in the field, but it's, uh, it means you can reprogram it in the field. That means when it's deployed. Now, um, as the name implies, it's a gate array, so it's, it's really a mesh of gates on that chip, which is connected through some sort of programmable fabric. Um, now, that fabric has uh, sort of like hundreds of megahertz kind of uh, speed, which is not that much. If you look at modern CPUs, they have like gigahertz speeds. Uh, but on the other hand, it's massively parallel. So um, what you can do is instead of running it at, at high frequencies, you can just leverage the parallelism and do some sort of pipelining, that sort of stuff. Now. Uh, the FPGAs, they have massive amounts of I.O. It's uh, generally all configurable, so when you as a user decide that you need, like, I don't know, 50 UARTs, you can very well do that. You just pop them in the FPGA and then you get a chip which has 15 UARTs. No problem there. And that's actually one of the really uh, significant use cases for FPGA is that um, if you need some sort of custom functionality for which it's not worth manufacturing an ASIC, you can just pop in an FPGA with that functionality and define it as user. And actually, if, if you have some sort of bug in your hardware on the chip level, you can just deploy a new FPGA constant, new FPGA content, new FPGA bitstream, and just fix that bug literally on that chip, which is awesome. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's one use case. The other use case is uh, stemming from uh, the massive parallelism of the FPGA. So it's, it's like some sort of uh, data processing, streaming data processing. You, just pipe data into the FPGA, do some transformation, maybe some image processing, some sort of filtering, collect it on the other side, possibly in a reduced form, 
uh, that sort of thing. Cryptography as well, you know, just stream data in, maybe do some sort of uh, symmetric cipher in the FPGA, that sort of stuff. Yeah, it's great for that. Uh, you can even pop a CPU into the FPGA, but uh, due to the properties of the FPGA, it's not going to be amazingly fast. Uh, so if you put in a small CPU, it's going to be okay-ish. You can probably run it at like 100, maybe even 200 uh, megahertz. Depends on the FPGA and depends on the design. If you pop in something really complex, it will be slower. Now, the reason for that are signal propagation delays in the FPGA. Uh, because um, I'll explain it on the next slide. But uh, the thing is, with the FPGA, you kind of emulate hardware in hardware, right? And if you have some sort of signal going through the entire FPGA, it will be passing a lot of gates on the inside, and every gate is adding a little bit of delay. Now, if that adds up, you get some sort of delay on that routing of, of that wire. And now, if you have two signals, one which is really short, one which is really long, then the short signal has to actually wait on the long signal, and then eventually your design will not be able to run at high frequencies enough because that signal propagation delay just adds up, and you have to slow down everything. Uh, yeah, so, so keep that in mind, but you know, you, you can kind of avoid that with the parallelism. Now, uh, this is the last slide on FPGA. Uh, I want to explain how the FPGAs really work on the inside, because I believe there is just no, do no good documentation on how it really works. Uh, and it's super simple, actually. Uh, and the FPGA vendors will be telling you it's super complex. And yes, I cannot do really good graphics. Um, so. On the left side, uh, you see sort of a die shot of an FPGA, all right? Now, the black boxes there on, on the side are the physical pads uh, on the FPGA chip or, or maybe the, the legs of the chip. Now, these are rooted into this, this all-encompassing blue goop, uh, which is around everything. And uh, the blue goop is something they call the global interconnect. It behaves like a massive switchboard. And it's really like if you take a breadboard, bring out some wires, that, that's basically what we're talking about right now. And it's connecting everything on the FPGA. Uh, on the, in the middle, you see the, the red uh, rectangles. Uh, this is where you implement your logic. So the basic principle, the way the FPGA works is you implement your logic on the inside, you connect it together through the programmable switchboard, through blue stuff, and you route it out on the pads which also connect into the switchboard. That's it. It's that simple. Uh, but most of the FPGA wonders actually do a sort of a optimization there. So um, the, the logic blocks on, on the, in the middle of the FPGA, they are called the logic array blocks in, in case of Altera. And there is sort of a local optimization, which you can see on the top right. Um, you see, each of these blocks is composed of like 10 or 16, depends on the FPGA uh, logic elements. Now, these logic elements are connected through local interconnect, and it's sort of fast local connection. And that local interconnect then connects into the global interconnect. Uh, the reason for that is, uh, if you're implementing stuff like registers, which have, surprisingly, 16 bits, for example, right? Uh, then it fits nicely into this sort of local optimization and everything is connected through the local interconnect and it doesn't waste the global interconnect. And it's faster and it's awesome. Um, now, if you drill even deeper into that stuff and look at one of these logic elements into one of these basic building cells of the FPGA, you can see it there at the right bottom, uh, you will see that this is basically just a lookup table which you can program and an optional register. All right? now. Uh, the lookup table you can program, it has like four or six inputs, depends on the FPGA again. And this allows you to construct uh, combinatorial logic. Means you put something on the input, something comes out of the output. It's binary. Okay, and, and you define the function of that. So you can define NAND gates, end gates, any sort of pretty much gates. And the register allows you to synchronize that stuff to, uh, to the clock internal in the FPGA. So you can build sequential logic with that. And the register, again, is optional. You can turn it on or off. And now by chaining these small bits together through the interconnects, you can build any sort of complex logic functions. Yeah, that's, that's how the FPGA works. Uh, do you have any questions about this FPGA stuff? Because that's it. Yo, everyone understands that. That's awesome. 
Uh, okay, yeah, so the reason why you want to combine SOC and FPGA, usually it's cost, because uh, if you need an FPGA, having a discrete chip um, adds to the board cost. Everyone's cost cutting today, so having it uh, on a single discrete package is awesome. Also, it helps you in that you do not have to design high bandwidth, high throughput interconnects between the CPU and the, and the FPGA. Uh, which can be challenging on, on the boards. And also, in the SOG FPGAs, usually you have a uh, high speed, low latency interconnect between the CPU and the FPGA on that chip. So that this is also another benefit of that. Now, uh, I want to talk first about Altera Intel, just because they are first in the alphabet. Um, so these people have uh, three product lines on the market. Um, actually, they had four. In like 2002, Altera had this chip which was called uh, the Excalibur. Uh, it was ARMv4, uh, ARM920T, and it, it cost uh, like 20,000 at that point, which, which was crazy. Uh, and there is a sort of U-boot port for that, but no one cares anymore today. Anyway, uh, it just exists. Uh, what is relevant today are these three product families. Uh, the first one, Cyclone 5, Aria 5, are ARMv7, Cortex A9. Um, the next one which came after that is uh, Aria 10, where they didn't really change that much on the SOC part. They just again replaced an FPGA in there and uh, they slightly changed the boot process. <coughs> and finally, uh, recently Intel came out with Stratix 10, which is their 64-bit offering. Mm. So let's talk about U-Boot first. <clears throat> a short note on, on U-Boot. There is a BSP U-Boot for this, which is a total disaster, and it has bugs which are unfixed in there, which we know about. Uh, they are fixed in mainline U-Boot. So there is really no reason to use non-mainline U-Boot on these chips. Now, um, in case of Cyclone 5 and Aria 5 uh, in mainline U-Boot, uh, not much really changed because that stuff is supported since 2013, 14, something like that, and it's quite well supported. Uh, there are mostly bug fixes coming in now. Uh, one significant change that happened on the Cyclone 5, Aria 5 uh, is uh, the debug UART fix in uh, U-Boot SPL. And that debug UART fix actually fixed a bit of a memory corruption also in the SPL, which kind of appeared and disappeared over time, and no one was able to pin it down until, uh, um, was that, uh, Simon Goldschmidt actually sent these patches and also fixed this. And these landed in uh, the latest release, the 2018.09. So if you want to use U-Boot on that, uh, you should just use the latest release. And in fact, you just should use the latest release. I mean, it doesn't make sense to use anything else, uh, except for you would master, obviously, if you're doing any sort of new board development. Now, um, the other thing which changed uh, since recently is uh, NAND support. So uh, it seems that it became popular recently that we have NANDs with 4K pages and uh, 224 bytes OOB, right? And until this kind of started appearing on the market, we had uh, NAND flashes with, uh, I don't know, 2K pages, which is awesome, and uh, 128 bytes OOB. And surprisingly, this is cache line aligned on this Cortex-A9 stuff. But uh, when uh, this 224 bytes OOB came, it became cache aligned, and uh, if uh, someone does unaligned cache operations in U-Boot, they just don't go through and you get a warning message. So when these NAND flashes started popping up, well, we started getting warning messages that uh, online cache operations happen. And uh, this in turn triggered data corruption when using uh, you know, the NAND or UB or that sort of stuff. So this is also now fixed. If you are using NAND in any way in U-Boot, use, well, latest mainline. Uh, another word of advice, if you are using UBFS in UBoot, be careful, it, it might be broken. UB is okay, UBFS uh, is still kind of work in progress, uh, fix in progress sort of situation there, okay? Uh, unless there are some news, which I don't know about. There probably aren't. Uh, right, now, Ariaten is a bit of a special case. So until, I would say, 
ELC time this year, which is like uh, February, March, I think. Uh, this was a completely broken disaster in, in Upstream U, but it seems like from Altera, no one really cares about it. They, they have like one person working on it, and it seems to be this sort of unwanted product. Uh, then again, funding happened and the work on that started, uh, so it became unbroken uh, to the point where a lot of stuff which was sitting in our, our Maxog FPGA in U-Boot just got pulled out and pushed into drivers. There is now a proper reset driver, there is proper proper, proper read-only clock driver, um, which by the way has its reasons why it's read-only. Um, there is a pin control and actually the state in which this was was actually using old clock setup bindings, which are generated by the Altera tool. Uh, so that had to be completely converted to the new ones. This is now also fixed. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, and uh, the entire boot process on ARIA 10 is, is really uh, um, different from the Generation 5. Uh, you see, on the Generation 5, when you wanted to boot the system, basically you turned on the power, the, the system did read 64K out of the boot media, it loaded it into the OCRAM, and the code in the OCRAM configured uh, the pin moves, clock, uh, lo started the DRAM, and loaded the U-boot into the DRAM, and then jumped to the U-boot and everything was great. On the ARIA 10, they had the smart idea that they will connect the DRAM controller through the FPGA. So, oh, but they increased the OCRAM, which is awesome. So you have 256K of OCRAM, you load the U-boot SPL in there, it starts executing and it needs to load the FPGA bitstream in order to start the DDR, DDR controller. Uh, well, the FPGA bitstream is uh, 16 megabytes, right? So it doesn't fit into the 256K OCRAM, so there has to be some sort of uh, partial loading. Uh, so you, you load the file in parts into the OCRAM, then program it into the FPGA in parts, and, and you go in the loop until the FPGA is loaded. Um, so that's the situation there. Now, Intel seems to be working on some sort of firmware loader for U-Boot, which is how it should be done, some sort of abstract firmware loader, which will plug into the FPGA manager in U-Boot and load the FPGA, but they've been working on that for like a year or something, and, and they're not making much progress, which is kind of sad, but hopefully there is some, some new initiative to get it in order. So uh, I hope that in a couple of releases we'll see a proper solution to that. Now, until then, uh, I developed like a... 10 patches, which are out of three, but they are sitting in the U-Bootsog FPGA repo, which allow you to at least uh, load the bitstream from an SD card into the FPGA and start mainline U-Boot. So with these 10 patches, that at least works. Uh, what is still missing is uh, booting from a QSPI flash, although that should be kind of easy, and booting from NAND flash. That is going to be challenging, uh, because you probably want to store the bitstream in a UB, and starting a UB in 256K of uh, RAM is gonna be sort of challenging. Uh, if you assemble the UB map, it's like megabytes in size. So without RAM, this is difficult. Uh, right, uh, and a quick update on the, on the strat extend. There's really not much to say. Intel has massive interest in that, so they are canon forwarding patches upstream. Uh, recently, they finished uh, generation of this hex file, which, which is necessary for the strat extend to generate the proper payload, which they then patch into the FPGA bitstream, uh, because the strat extend really doesn't boot the the U boot out of anywhere else but the FPGA bitstream. So you load the FPGA bitstream into the FPGA, it ungates the CPU cores, and the CPU cores, cores read out the U boot uh, SPL from block RAM in the FPGA. And uh, so with U boot master, you can now also generate the hex file for strat extend, and you can boot strat extend. Awesome. Okay. Now, uh, what else do we have here? Uh, Linux support. Um, vendor kernel, again, doesn't make sense to use that. Uh, just don't. Uh, generation 5 uh, is completely supported in mainline. Um, there's really no reason to use the, the vendor kernel. Uh, ARIA 10, uh, there is a bit of a dependency on bootloader. Uh, so since you would recently got the reset driver, um, it is now a little bit more energy efficient because it doesn't unreset everything. Uh, on the other hand, Linux is missing some of the reset bindings on ARIA 10, so uh, for example, for timer, it doesn't unreset the timer. And uh, 
when you boot the Linux kernel with mainline uBoot, which also doesn't unreset all the timers, Linux will just freeze and it will not print anything. Now, um, this has been reported and it seems Altera people are working on that. And it's gonna be fixed eventually. It, the fix is a little bit more convoluted because you actually need to have reset controller support early on in the timer driver and that sort of thing. But it's, it's being worked on. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh yeah, FPGA device tree overlay support uh, in mainline Linux, well, the thing is, we have FPGA manager there, we have device tree overlay support, what's missing is the config of us loader and that's uh, probably not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, you can backport the sort of patch uh, and then you get the config of us interface. Now that works, I believe, until like 4.14, then there was some sort of API change, internal one in the Linux kernel, so you need to tweak the patch a little, but otherwise you can still apply that. Uh, the other way around, uh, this is to load the FPGA in uBoot, which is completely supported, and use the, FP, uh, the external FPGA config in your device tree. You just describe the content of the FPGA behind the bridges. Uh, the FPGA manager will just assume the FPGA is already loaded, will enable the bridges, and bind the hardware, and so on. That's gonna be done. All right, um, right. Um, there's another note about ARIA 10, uh, about this, this DDR controller stuff they have. Uh, you cannot reprogram the FPGA completely in Linux because you would cut off the DDR controller, obviously, which would suck. Uh, so you have to do partial reconfiguration on the ARIA 10, but uh, it's just a detail. Um, threat extend support, again, this is a big thing for Intel, so it's, it's really decent at this point. The vendor kernel doesn't make sense at all. Uh, and that's it for Altera. Uh, do you have any quick questions about this Altera stuff? Is there anything? Yes. Uh, why do they did this sort of thing uh, with the DDR controller? I actually have no idea. Uh, go ahead. I can just repeat the question. Uh, I can just repeat the question if you want. <laughs> there we go. Uh, the A plus some other core. Oh, there we go. Uh, the A plus uh, R cores or A plus M is becoming a common design because to do a microcontroller, you can definitely do real time stuff with that quite easily yeah. compared to doing it on Linux. Doesn't mean you can't do it on Linux. But there's a lot of use cases where doing an R class or an M class means you don't have to waste FPGA cells to implement another CPU. Um, yeah, that's, that's in the Zing MPU, right? But it's not in the Altera stuff. I don't believe they have well, uh, sorry, uh, hardcores. What, what, yeah, that, that's, what was, oh, yeah, that's Wasn't silent. the question about A plus R? Yeah. Oh, oh, oh yeah. The, Am the I question was a question no, that no, no. The, the question, the question was, uh, why do uh, why did Altera put a DDR controller behind an FPGA on the SOC FPGA? So, like, you literally have like Cortex A9 FPGA fabric and a DDR controller, and you have to program the FPGA in order to access the DDR controller. That, that's because you've often got FPGA hardware or FPGA um, logic talking to the DDR controller directly. If they wired it oh, yeah. up straight, then you can't use it from logic. Oh, you can. On the generation five, that's what they do. So they have a dedicated bridge on the generation five into the SD-ROM controller, and this is possible. Um, actually, my guess is that they are manufacturing both uh, systems with and without the ARM cores, and the ARM cores are kind of secondary function, so they can like pull them out and it's still gonna work. So yeah, really, the, the ARM core is kind of second class citizen in, in this sort of setup, and they are trying to like isolate it further. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, let's talk about Xilinx now. Uh, Xilinx has two product families on the market. Uh, one is the Zinc 7000, the other is the Zinc Ultra Scale Plus, uh, Zinc MP. Uh, the Zing 7000 is generally a direct competitor to the Gen 5. Uh, it's Cortex uh, A9. Um, and it has the usual set of peripherals uh, DDR controller, IP blocks, and so on and so forth. 
Uh, the Zing MP is more interesting in that it's uh, RMV8, uh, A53, uh, it has a Cortex-R in it, uh, and it has optionally GPU, which we'll talk about in a bit. Now, um, the Wake Xilinx recommends to boot this platform using their own FSPL bootloader, which is BSD licensed, and it initializes the platform pin marks, clock, um, what else is there? Oh yeah, DDR controller, it optionally loads the FPGA and then it loads U-boot into the DDR and executes the U-boot, right? Now, um, the obvious question is, can U-boot do the same? And the answer to that is yes, so there is really no reason to use that. Uh, but uh, in order to understand how that works with U-boot, uh, we should really decompose the, the, all, the entire FSPL uh, setup. So. Actually, what the Zing is booting is a file called bootbin. Now, this is some sort of weird header slash envelope around the FSPL and uBoot. And this is generated by a proprietary tool from Xilinx called bootgen, all right? Now, the FSPL itself is BSD licensed. And the way you generate the FSPL is you take the Xilinx design tool, the Vivado, uh, and you design your FPGA and kind of co-design, co-configure uh, the SOC part, and then you press generate, and it, it will chuck on for like a day or something, produce a HDF file. Now, this HDF file is actually the renamed zip file, so you can just unzip it, and it contains a couple of files. Uh, and the relevant ones are uh, ps 7 initc and uh, ps 7 inith now, what Xilinx tells you to do is take these files, put them into the FSPL, compile FSPL, and you get FSPL binary, and then, then you wrap it all up with boot gen, and uh, you generate the boot bin. But you can also take these files and put them into like board slash uh, Xilinx, or your name of the board in the uboot sources, slash uh, something. I mean, if you just look into this board directory for these files, you'll find a couple of examples. And then you run make, and it will check out uBoot SPL, and it will also check out uh, uBoot binary. And since recently, uh, we also support generating uh, Zing image, which is, I believe, uh, Alexander's doing. Thank you very much for that. Uh, so the uBoot MK image now supports Zing image, and it can generate the boot bin. So it will take the uBoot SPL, it will take uBoot, wrap it up, and produce boot.bin, which you can install on the platform. It will just work, it will just boot. Now, in fact, um, these ps7 init.c and .h files, they only contain like a list of register writes to initialize the platform, and that's pretty much what's in those files, all right? Uh, now, yeah, the, the Zing MP image generation, by the way, is in since 2018.09, I believe. So, again, another reason to use mainline uBoot, right? Uh, on Zing MP, the situation is a little bit more complicated in that uh, they have two more things in there. Uh, one of them is the power management unit firmware, the other is uh, ARM trusted firmware, which actually is just a thin shim which is communicating with the PMU firmware. Now, uh, the PMU firmware is there for a PMU unit which is responsible for enabling stuff like clock, power domains on the chip because it's complex and, and they want to do some sort of power management and that sort of thing. Um, now, the firmwares, these two are, I believe, BSD licensed, but anyway, Xilinx provides them, and again, the process is the same. You extract the, this time, PSU init files. Um, you just combine them with the PM, uh, PMU firmware sources, generate PMU firmware binary. Uh, same for ATF, which I don't think needs these files. Um, you generate FSPL, wrap it up together with a boot bin, uh, with the boot gen, get a boot bin, install it on the platform, done. Uh, but uh, the same thing can be done with mainline uBoot now, since a couple of releases ago. Um, you only need these binaries uh, for the PMU firmware, for uh, the ATF. That needs to be present during the build. And then you can just compile, again, uh, the uBoot SPL, the uBoot, and use uBoot MK image to wrap them together into a boot bin. And install it on your platform and it will work. Now, the way the loading of the PMU firmware and ATF is done is, uh, there is, I believe, a massive fit image which describes what goes where. 
And so the SPL parses the fit image and accordingly loads the stuff at the right locations. Uh, it is also capable of loading the FPGA bitstream, which you can optionally load during the SPL stage. For example, in case U-boot needs something in the FPGA and is actually using it. Otherwise, you can use the FPGA command in U-boot to load the FPGA later on. That's also possible. <clears throat> yeah, so that's, that's the, uh, the Zinc and B situation. Oh, uh, right, and if you're using this uh, popular boot mode, which is booting from a QSPI flash, 2018.09 uh, has a driver for that, an upstream one. Uh, before that, the driver was still in review. So there is that, okay. Now, uh, Linux kernel support uh, on Zinc, that stuff is just supported upstream, so there is no reason to not use it, mainline Linux. Uh, with Zing MP, the situation is a bit more complicated because uh, the Xilinx tree still contains platform enablement patches like, you know, clock, PinMux, uh, firmware interface for the power management unit firmware, that sort of stuff. And this is not mainline yet. It's being pushed upstream, but it's, it's not all there. Uh, and actually, a while ago, what Xilinx did with their vendor kernel tree is they, they maintained the tree and merged in the latest LTSI Linux kernel, right? Which produced this sort of history which had patches growing in, into it. Uh, it was a disaster. So this improved uh, with like 4.9 and 4.14 where they at least rebased their stack of patches. So they have like thousand patches on top of that. Uh, you can cut it down and get like 300 patches which are relevant for the MP and then the platform is usable but you're still kind of stuck with 300 patches and we basically hope that the situation will improve over time as, as the patches get upstream. Um, I forgot to mention one thing which uh, touches both Linux and, and U-boot actually uh, when I was talking about the firmwares, the power management unit firmware. So there is some sort of an ABI which both uh, Linux and U-boot uses to communicate with the power management unit, which is a dedicated uh, microblaze core. And it would seem that Xilinx is not very good at maintaining that ABI. And in 2018.1 release of their stuff, they changed the ABI in an incompatible way. It wasn't the end. Oh God. <laughs> yeah, so well that happened. And what that results in is if you use U-boot, which is not up to date enough with that new ABI and or Linux and use the old power management unit firmware and some sort of combination, the platform will not print anything. It will not print any sort of warning message. It will just not work, which really sucks. So you have to make sure that you have all the components with the right ABI version. Otherwise, it will not tell you that you are not doing it right, which is really sad. Be careful about that. I had to find it the, the hard way and, and it sucked, okay? But anyway, now that you have your uh, 300 patches on top of the Linux with the right version of the power management unit firmware and, and the right kernel patches, uh, you can also take these patches and rebase them on 418. If you really select those 300 patches, and I can actually tell you which ones you need, uh, it's easy to rebase it on, on latest uh, Linux master and then, then use it so you can run the latest mainline, plus a couple of patches, not this entire disastrous vendor stack. And actually, um, if you have these patches, you can even try the Lima driver. Now, uh, the situation with the Lima driver is, is great because in the last year, a lot of uh, progress happened on that. Um, so, the thing is, uh, Xilinx decided to have a GPU in some of these chips, and they didn't really care probably what sort of GPU they want. They just wanted to have some sort of GPU, so they, they picked the low-end Mali 400 MP2, they popped it in, and for a while they were distributing blobs. Um, but it turns out that on these low-cost development kits, um, there's also Mali 400 GPU, and the community around these low-cost development kits is really massive and it's active, and a couple of people started working on a driver for this, uh, Mali 400 which is great. 
and they actually submitted the kernel patches in the 4.17 RC5 uh, window. They didn't make it because there was some review feedback, then they rebased it, uh, and uh, now it's 4.18, they are planning to submit it again. Uh, but the kernel patches, is like, that's 20 patches or something. It's just adding the DRM stuff. So it's in pretty good condition. You can pick them, actually. You can apply them on, well, anything past the 4.17 RC5, because anything before that is missing significant DRM framework changes. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, with those patches and the device tree bindings for Mali, which are actually valid on the Zinc, you can just boot the kernel, and if you enable that, you will see in the log that uh, the Lima driver bound to the Mali 400 MP2. Now, with this sort of setup, you can then grab the user space and put the user space in order by running the latest libdrm and grabbing Mesa from yeah from this link in the middle, uh, and you can compile Mesa with these configuration options, uh, which will give you the, the interface to this uh, Lima kernel DRM driver. And once you have that stuff uh, done, you can, for example, compile KMS cube and it's gonna work, okay? Uh, you can actually even run Valent on this stuff, which is impressive. Although there will be some sort of graphics artifacts because uh, I believe there's some sort of partial update stuff still missing from the Mesa part. Anyway. Uh, it's, it's really impressive work, and if you think this would be sufficient for you, using the Lima driver on the Zing MP is so significantly much better than using the blobs and fighting the blobs, which are missing stuff like GBM, uh, and you're really just fighting ugly stuff that just use this and contribute if you find some bugs and you can fix them. It is so much less pain this stuff. Right, uh, yeah, here's the list of the kernel patches. In case you're interested, just grab the slides and, and you know, pick those. And this is actually something I, I stole from a Google Plus of one of the developers, Vasily Kroshuk. I'm not sure I pronounced that name correctly. Uh, but this is the Lima driver rendering, uh, I believe, GLMark. Okay, so the GLMark just works by now. It really just does, which is impressive. Uh, the link is below if you want to see the entire video. This is a, just a single frame from the video. Now, okay, security topics. That's, that's the last slide I have. Um, so I had this sort of exchange on the, on one of the mailing lists. Anyway, it doesn't matter which one. And uh, I'm sure you heard about all these fancy hardware bugs recently. Um, and you may be wondering, okay, is the SOC FPGA vulnerable or not? Uh, the answer is uh, yes, kind of. Um, the thing is, Linux kernel is able to fiddle with some of the hardware bits, depending on, on which bug we are talking about, and uh, apply the protection. So you don't have to really patch anything. Um, you just update the kernel, and the kernel it, and that sort of operation mode is magically secure. But there is, there is this but. Uh, if you're running anything else on that platform, like for example, the kernel is running in non-secure, and you have something else running in secure, then magically updating just the kernel will not fix the secure part. So if you want to be sure that your entire platform is secure, you have to really thoroughly audit the whole thing. It is not enough to update just the kernel. It will not magically fix it. You have to go through the entire software stack and make sure that everything that's running on the platform is running with those fixes applied for those hardware bugs. Okay, that's the message I, I want to convey. That especially applies on all these trusted uh, operating systems which are running there doing some sort of DRM and that sort of things. You have to fix them up as well. Uh, yeah, so this, this is my brief security slide. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Um, just to recap, there's a lot of programmable devices available. And there is really no reason to not use mainline U-boot Linux on them. Uh, and possibly graphics drivers, but that's just getting there. Um, if you have some sort of specific functionality which you need, which is not in mainline, um, you can cherry pick it from the vendor tree, tweak it, adjust it as needed, and try getting upstream. <coughs> there will be someone coming in uh, later on, and they'll probably need it as well. So if you upstream it, 
you will do them a favor. Keep in mind that you're consuming code, which many other people got upstream and, and you got it for free. So, you know, upstreaming is also good. And with that, yeah, thank you for your attention and questions. Yes, go ahead. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Hi, uh, Lima, mm -hmm. OpenCL, what's the status on that? OpenCL is not yet happening, not at all. I mean, they're, they're still trying to get the um, shader compiler, the, the NIR compiler in order so they can do 3D rendering and that sort of stuff. So you can run yeah, your 3D applications, uh, Valent, that sort of stuff before they can start digging into OpenCL. And I'm not even sure if the GPU is OpenCL capable at all. It possibly is, but there is no, uh, someone is saying no, but all right. If that's the case, okay, thank you. You do not happen to be working on that project, are you? Uh, there. The, we, we pay for some of the work, so. So, very so good. Lima, it was done by some guy, uh, Yak Chen from AMD in sh China. Oh, he's so, from AMD? Yeah, awesome. he's, in his spare time, he, he worked on it, and then we sort of paid them for it in his spare time. Oh, that's, that's very nice. So, we're, we're looking forward to that thing maturing as well. That's very nice. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> the proprietary, the vendor kernels from Altera for Cyclone and uh, Altera Sock FPGA. You said they they were questionable patches, but what are what are these patches for? Oh yeah, well one of the examples is the uh, the uh, what is that the cross trigger interface, I believe, which is not supported in mainline. Grant maybe. So they, they have this really obscure debugging functionality where you can do like uh, run perf and collect hardware events, but that goes through the PMU, right? And that is somehow wired on the SOC FPGA into the CTI interface, which is not supported. And they have this like ugly hack there, which somehow wires at least the CPU events to that and configures it. And it's really just a hack to arc arm code, which pokes some registers. And it works, okay, yeah, but we now have a proper framework for that, which is the hardware events thing, if I'm not mistaken. Not the expert on that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what's the name of it, but uh, there is a proper framework for the PMU and all these sort of related technologies. Right. And there is, there is also a lot of like vendor specific stuff. Someone wanted something, something, uh, so they just put it in there and they keep maintaining that. Usually you do not need that stuff. So to that two small notes, um, I like to try, take credit, but I did not uh, do the normal boot.bin thing in, uh, in, in, in new boot. Okay. In the make image, the only thing I did was I extended the existing boot bin support to be able to read BIF files. So you can now oh. have full-fledged uh, boot bins that contain multiple different image formats and image pieces and combine them into one and you're not restricted to only SPL and uh, PMU firmware. You can also include a bitstream, right. for example, which is needed for the Alta 96 where uh, they thought it would be a smart idea to put your serial port into the bitstream. Right. Um, because the two, on, the two hardwired ones are not enough, apparently. Uh, the other bit is uh, mainline kernel support for Xilinx. Mm -hmm. um, it's not as bad as you just, just picture it. Uh, okay. As long as you don't need anything that's fast, it works. So, anything so, that's so what? Anything that's fast. So USB 3.0 doesn't work, PCI Express doesn't work, uh, DisplayPort doesn't work. Anything fast, basically, anything that needs transceivers, uh, you need PMU support for that. But uh, right, uh, as, long, as long as you're down to USB 2.0, serial, i 2 c and a bit of FPGA logic, you're all fine. Uh, it just works out of the box in main, mainline. Yeah, okay, but then the chip is kind of useless at that point. So. No, it's very useful because you can make use of the FPGA logic. Right? Oh, okay. It depends, it depends on the use case, but it yeah, might actually that's be correct. useful. Yep. Yep. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? Anyone? Okay, so let's wrap it up. Thanks. Thanks.